Welcome to another episode of the All Turtles podcast, a show about entrepreneurship and AI. I'm John C. Fuentes, co-founder at All Turtles. On this episode, Jessica Collier and I interview Michelle Joe, co-founder and CEO of Juji. Juji is on a mission to build empathetic and responsible AI. Then we dig into another eye roll please segment and answer a listener question about AI regulation. We're so excited to be joined by Michelle Joe, the co-founder and CEO of Juji. So Michelle, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Michelle. And thank you for inviting me. Can you tell us a little bit about Juji or maybe walking back your work at IBM as a researcher and kind of how you came to to want to build this product? Sure. Uh, I spent uh, almost like 15 years at IBM Research and IBM Watson Group. So my passion has always been about uh, human-machine symbiosis. So I'm a big fan of the theory by the MIT professor called Lico Leiter. So he was talking about it is uh, the ultimate goal it is to having machines and humans work together and collaborate with each other. So at IBM have built a, a conversational systems and also uh, having a way of uh, uh, understanding, actually analyzing uh, people's data, analyzing people as a unique individuals, and on a lot level actually help people. So uh, from there, I wanted to start GG to really further the research you. Um, in the area in the field of a uh, human machine symbiosis. So basically, GG is an artificial intelligence company, and uh, we specialize in creating what we call the empathetic and responsible artificial uh, intelligence agents. That's interesting. And what, what's the mission of the company to develop this? So the mission AI? of the company, you will laugh. Or, uh, I'm wondering, have you watched the movie Her? Sure. Yeah. So we really wanted to create a platform where we can basically build a, a Her for everyone. Of course, it's empathetic and uh, responsible Her for everyone and uh, who actually can understand people as a unique individual and guide them in a very personal way. What's the use case that's solving for? Is it loneliness? Is it... Or is it a specific work example? Or? Great question. So you can think about uh, uh, this type of her can be used in a wide variety of the domains. So, for example, healthcare. So thinking about you are recuperating from your knee surgery, or maybe you are recuperating for a particular type of uh, like a, a disease, right? So this companion, this AI companion can actually... Uh, a company through this uh, recovery process and encourage you because uh, it really understands who you are, your interests, your needs, uh, and your personality. So they can give very personalized guidance and encouragement. Is there a certain degree of tricking users that they're interacting with uh, a human? Or is this known that this is an AI, this is a chatbot? You know, I'm I'm recovering from surgery, and what I really want is some time with my doctor to help me through this. And what I'm given is kind of like a device to interact with. How's how's that experience? Interesting you ask this question. Actually, many scientific studies have shown that uh, people are feeling much more comfortable with machines when they are at very vulnerable times because that's because they want to avoid what's so-called social desirability biases. Because they don't want other people view them as weak, as vulnerable. Mm. So they are much more honest and much more open to machines. There's some numerous studies, including ours, have shown that uh, um, like people who are at their vulnerable times, they like to chat. They are opening up to machines to tell them how they feel. So, of course, uh, in the current time, most of machines are not empathetic. So they don't know what people want. So they're not be able to show that kind of empathy. So our goal it is uh, to actually let machines do that, uh, to be a human's true companions. Is there something behind the name Juji? It's an interesting name. Oh, Juji actually is a two... Uh, 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 characters. Uh, it's a pronunciation of the two Chinese characters uh, means getting together. Uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, because our original meaning is uh, we want get people together because if we know each other more, there is a more understanding. There 
it's even word peace because you understand people oh, much more, right? Understand, so we don't, we don't impose our own thoughts, our own ideology on other people. What can Juji do now or, or what do people use it for? So there are uh, several use cases. So one of the uh, use cases is uh, Juji serves as uh, what we call the AI interviewer. So you can think about uh, in user research, in market research, as well as uh, at a university, uh, like a, a, a academic counselors, right? They wanted to interview their target audience to better understand their target audience. So Gigi has been used in that uh, uh, particular context quite a bit. So now we're actually creating Gigi as the almost online attendance. So online, we, when it's a website, but a website is very passive, right? So uh, people don't know what to do. So now you have this proactive, empathetic uh, AI attendance that can guide people through uh, the a website and they'll basically help them uh, to ach- achieve their goal, their achieve their mission as effective as possible. How does social desirability bias like work with those particular use cases? Because the use cases you're describing seem very um, kind of tactical and transactional, right? So it doesn't seem like the kind of interaction that a user would have with Juji in those cases is going to lead to a lot of kind of opening up or vulnerability. Actually, uh, uh, one of the use cases, the people use it to actually uh, in a scholarship program, veterans program. So veterans have gone through a lot. So this is a program help them to establish their second career. So because they have gone through a lot, uh, including potentially substance abuse or uh, post-traumatic syndrome. Or, yeah, post-traumatic uh, stress, 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 stress disorder, syndrome. Yeah. So um, and before they can guide them to build the next career. And uh, normally human coaches will talk to them one-on-one. Right. But uh, because of the strangers, like, for example, today, if we meet the first time, if you ask me very awkward questions, especially make me kind of uh, awkward to talk about it. Uh, now we're using this machine to talk to them and they are very, they open up quite a bit. So actually, the coaches said it is so they have never seen such of open conversations uh, in their career. So interesting. Do you think that people's fear of being judged when they're talking about something that's very traumatic or makes them feel quite vulnerable or is emotional. Um, Do you think that our ability to talk to machines about those things is possibly larger than our ability to talk to humans about them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, there's the professor, uh, Cliff uh, Nash. So he was a professor at the Stanford University of Psychology. So he had the book, a very interesting book on so basically, humans apply the so- same social rules in the real world and to the computer world. So in the computer world, they treat the machines like small children. So we think about it is hmm. when we talk to small children, we are much uh, less guarded, right? So we're being very open because we think children don't judge us. So that's a very similar social rules they apply to machines. And we have seen it over and over again. And uh, our actually uh, other colleagues in the AI field have seen it over and over again. In what other situations do you think that we could apply that for human benefit? Uh, great point. I think in career development. So like I uh, currently were working with uh, uh, several universities, right? So uh, one of their uh, common themes is called the student success. So a uh, lot of student uh, success uh, needs to attribute to uh, students actually know what, they're, what they want to be, right? But the most of the students at their young age, they may not even know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. So they may just follow the trend. So for example, every student said, I want to be accountant, or I want to be a computer scientist. But those professions may not be best for them based on their own talents and strengths. So at the early stages, if we can help them to truly discover themselves. And then, uh, so with the machine, I think they will open up, right? Like you can think about children, they will be talking to their imaginary friends. They'll be very open, but the many things they may not tell their parents or teachers, but they will tell their friends, right? So if AI can serve in that role, and of course, in a very discreet role, and we can help people to discover themselves and from a beginning, maybe their stage of their career, and actually guide them to build the career success for them. So that's why we're collaborating with universities to use this, our AI as a potential academic advisor, academic coach. Mm, so kind of helping people gradually unfurl to themselves, like who they want to be. 
by talking to a machine. <laughs> by talking, yeah. And uh, by the way, I wanted to kind of uh, bring back the issue it is at the beginning. I said it's called the human machine symbiosis. It's not I'm saying that those machines will replace humans. Actually, they prepare the humans to make better decisions, to derive better insights. So you probably still need. Uh, human advisors, right? But because they don't need to waste any time to better understand the individuals, so they can actually deliver probably better advices. So students actually told us uh, the first uh, thirty minutes they are talking to advisor. The advisor basically just asking questions, trying to understand who they are. But like in a one university, they have like thirty five thousand students, ten advisors. <laughs> Doesn't scale, right? right? So our work is to help that to actually. Uh, help them to scale their or expertise, to scale their guidance to the student body. For the product I work on, which is called Spot, which is a tool for reporting harassment and discrimination in the workplace, I think a lot about the handoff between what the per- like the person talking to Spot and then that what they've talked to Spot about getting handed off to somebody at their company, and then that their comp- like the person, the human at the company, needs to be able to like pick up where the bot left off. And I'm wondering how you think about that kind of handoff between Juji and the humans who are sort of operating Juji. Oh, interesting question. So actually, uh, uh, earlier I was uh, uh, talking about the program is for the veterans uh, career development program. So they did the handoff very interestingly. So first one, they let our, our AI to have a one-on-one personalized interview with each of the veteran. So our our AI would automatically output a a profile, if you will, basically indicating uh, what the strength is uh, of the veteran, as well as uh, uh, the question answering because the veterans have actually talked about, right? So the human coaches will use this uh, almost as the cheat sheet, if you will, right? So think about uh, a student coming or the doctor has a patient coming as if they already knew you for mm-hmm. a long time. So then they can deliver their guidance, their advice uh, almost immediately because humans are that smart, right? So that's why I keep stressing this uh, human-machine symbiosis is to let machines do the routine work uh, and let humans actually use that work uh, to derive insights uh, to actually make the critical decisions. Mm. How does empathy play a role in that routine work, right? Because we describe it as like routine or asking these questions that, that a machine could ask. But where does where does the empathy come in in that piece? Very, very good question. So what do we mean empathy it is? It's like kind of like our conversation, right? So I'm trying to also to see uh, what I said, how much, you, how much you comprehend it and how much you like it. Like we nod, we don't want. So this is exactly happening in our in our, our our AI and human conversation, so the AI keeps trying to understand where the person is, right? Also, use different types of encouragements. So, for example, yesterday we we're testing one for the education, right? So, uh, uh, the the students may be unwilling to answer a question, or maybe because shy, right? Because they are very kind of like timid and uh, by the particular type of questioning in terms of their study. So the AI, if knew that, would encourage you, would say, don't worry about it, right? Nobody will laugh at you. I just me here, hmm. right? So just give it a shot. So you kind of, you have this encouragement. But actually, we found this one in another opposite way too. Some people who are very overambitious, we talk to them, right? So overachievers. So they tend to, how do you say, over... Uh, represent themselves. Mm. They try to impress others, right? So in this case, actually, the chatbot, when I say about responsible, is precisely meaning that. So you have to look at the people's weakness as well to help them to realize that weakness. So in this case, they might say this, you know that? I know you're ambitious. I want. I know that you want to achieve more. But sometimes being humble could, could go a long way, <laughs> right? So uh, in this case, <laughs> so the chatbot really kind of stands on your best friend this uh, kind of uh, angle, right, to help you basically to show your best. So having like various kinds of hard conversations. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I think they probably, the humans, we haven't tested this one yet. It's in, uh, down the pipeline to see uh, when they, when, uh, when the AI, we're talking about a, a more negative part of it, how humans uh, would uh, actually take that, right? So we have mm. been, actually so far, we have been showing a positive aspect of it and humans have taken very well. And um, so the uh, negative one is our, ne- our next 
actually. Yeah. And giving constructive feedback is so exactly. hard. Yeah. 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 And also humans are, as I said, the social desirability bias is both ways, right? And conversation partners. And sometimes you don't want to offend them. You feel like, and also people are guessing your uh, intention as well, right? Um, so in this case, at least uh, uh, the machine sits out of the loop trying to be mm. kind of intentionally harm somebody. And uh, what do we want to prevent it? that from happening. Right. Well, and there's also the 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 danger of I think what Kim Scott calls ruinous empathy, right? Where you're unwilling to challenge the person directly, but you do go through a lot of effort to show that you care. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And it's like how do we train bots to demonstrate, you know, radical candor? <laughs> Right. Yeah. So that's why I mentioned in this one. So we gave us the slogan of being empathy and also being responsible. So it's very important. So I'm going to kind of cite this uh, Spider. I think Spider Man movie is talking about cartoon that like, uh, with great power and uh, comes with great uh, uh, responsibility. responsibility. Right. So I think uh, uh, if the think about it, it's very scary in some way too. If a machine understand individuals so deeply, including your weaknesses and strengths, and the machine can do a lot of harm as well as help as well, right? So that's why as the AI scientists, we need to really instill that kind of responsibility into our products as well. That's mm -hmm. interesting. You mean responsible from a one-on-one -on -one communication perspective and not from, say, a regulatory perspective? I think both, Right, regulatory as well as uh, uh, also from a one-on-one -on -one individual, uh, because our end user are still being individuals, right? So, like exactly like Jessica mentioned, uh, if they're only saying the positive side of it and uh, there's no candor, mm -hmm. it would be very. Oh, uh, I think that's not a good thing for the individuals either. Right. I can yeah. see them not trusting this overly positive bot interaction. That's a great point as well, right? I mean, that's the direction that a lot of sort of interfaces and apps have gone, right? So delight rather than substance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think we're seeing it with bots in particular because bots are seen to have personalities, right? And so those personalities must be delightful and positive and fun to interact with as opposed to like substantive and challenging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So actually interesting, we had have an article just published that's talking about uh, uh, how people actually trust the machines based on the personas of the machines. And you found out that uh, the cheerful personas will actually make people trust the machines less. Mm. <laughs> we have a serious, a very kind of a, a, a reserved persona. They tend to trust more and they actually open up more. They are, are especially like I was talking about, uh, like uh, uh, they don't want to over-represent themselves. They'll be much more honest to themselves too yeah that's will you share that research with us we could put it in the show notes that would be really sure. nice for yeah. people to be able to see yeah sure where can we interact with juji oh actually you can go to our website our web page and we always kind of like uh, uh publicize it is i said if you are ai company you should let other people interact with your ai publicly otherwise we don't believe you mm. <laughs> company so um if you go to our website uh, we have this receptionist and you can go talk uh, to chat with the, I think, I don't know, it's it, right? Because it's, have no, it's gender neutral. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, after maybe 10 minutes chat, it will, it will tell you what it knows about you in terms of your top strengths hmm. as well. <laughs> That's go interesting. Go give it a shot. Yeah, right? Have fun. What Gigi <laughs> have fun. thinks of me. <laughs> have fun, yeah. <laughs> and what's next for the company? What's for the product? Are you rolling it out to these different use cases in healthcare or something more transactional or yeah, this counselor so use case? So we have both more transactional and also long-term companionship, like, for example, for education or for or potentially healthcare, right? So uh, uh, right now, our product offers uh, actually uh, uh, self-serving as well. So you can think about it. If they want to use this as an interview to do market research or user research, uh, re the human researchers can go there just as if they're using SurveyMonkey and Quatrix, mm. right? So another one, it's a more, it is if you want to customize it for long-term use, let's say, for example, being an artificial intelligence human caretaker, right? So in this case, you need a more, about a more uh, customization. We also help them to do that. Hmm. In that case, we will charge a set of fee, but normally we will charge probably just a subscription fee because there is self, it's a self-service. Can you tell us a little bit about how you design the questions that Juji asks? Like, do they have particular characteristics that you design for? 
And、uh, we actually currently we have two types of questions, right? So one type of question is really coming from our clients. So for example, if somebody who wants to interview their employees to understand their employees' opinions and insights, so their questions coming from them. And、uh, because our our analysis of understanding humans' needs and personality are, do not depend on type of questions, because、mm-hmm. we are looking at a very fine grained evidence as how you answer versus what you answer, right? So a、uh, second type of questions we offer because we have a question bank, so called,、uh, that helps、uh, our customers because not everybody is a conversationalist, right? Not a writer like a screenplay writer. So we give them, for example, how did you open up the conversation? We call the warm up questions, and in the middle, how do you actually go ask questions if you want to incite more insightful opinions from your customers, your target audience, right? So then there's a wrap up. How do you say goodbye? So、mm-hmm. we have those kind of a, a question bank, so people can pick and choose and customize as well. Interesting. I I imagine that you don't want to be asking like closed questions, for example, or leading questions. Is that right?、Or? That's correct.、Yeah. That's very correct. So that's a very good question too. So we, when we're working with our clients when they come over, we always encourage them to look at our question bank to make sure that they choose questions that are open ended to basically to elicit more responses, thoughtful responses from their customers. Yeah. Interestingly, I just asked that question in a closed form. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Michelle, thanks so much for joining us, and thanks for sharing what you're working on with Juji. It's really fascinating. Yeah, thank you very much for your invitation. Oh yeah, thanks for coming. Now it's time for our eye roll, please segment, in which we discuss the bad advice that makes its way around Silicon Valley and offer our takes on it. Some axioms, some common wisdom from venture investors, especially, is that when you're working on something, a way to know that it's important enough is if you're targeting the biggest possible opportunity. Yeah, you know, I guess that depends on、uh, what kind of investors you're trying to talk to, but more importantly, like why you particularly care what investors think. There's definitely some, you know, conventional VCs that、uh, will only invest in things if they if it could be a really large uh, exit, um, you know, a, a multi-billion-dollar outcome. Although there's plenty of other sources of capital that don't have that requirement,、uh, but also like your biggest exit isn't necessarily dependent on addressing the biggest possible market. I think that's probably the flaw in thinking.、Mm. Like your biggest exit could be addressing something focused and just doing it really well. Right. Like serving a ser- serving a relatively small community, but doing it really well, so that your product kind of gets into the skin of the people you're trying to reach, and、uh, kind of becomes their default way of doing something, could be a lot more valuable than you know doing something kind of mediocre for a large number of people. What are some markers for doing it well? Doing it efficiently? Well, I think I think that the kind of shortcut to product market fit is、um, to make something that that is the default answer for some segment of people for some for some problem that they have.、Hmm. Like I think, if you can tell, like what is, like what is your product the default answer to, and, and, and for whom? Like there's there's got to be some people on the planet who, when they have some specific problems, think of like your product as the way that they deal with that.、Uh, and if you don't have that, or if it's not clear what that is, then it's almost certainly not particularly good product market fit. Right. But the、uh, the sooner that you can get to that feeling where you you've become the default answer to somebody's question. The sooner you know that you have good fit and and can scale from there, even if it's a relatively small number of people at first. Sure, yeah, which is super hard to predict. I know, you know, we talk at All Turtles about these sort of day zero、uh, type companies that have come out, and you know, I think we started working on a product similar, or you know, could fit that mold that Jessica that you're taking on. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely thinking of、um, of like one of the major possibilities for Spot is that it's just a day zero product, right? You start a company and you're like. Oh, I should make sure that I'm thinking through like how people are going to talk about inappropriate behavior, or unfair treatment at my company, and I need to make sure that I'm creating an environment where, like, a diverse and inclusive team is comfortable and can thrive. Right. So maybe I just buy this product now and like have the system in place from the beginning so that we can kind of. Grow the culture from like a place of accountability and positivity. We're definitely targeting bigger customers too, but I see the day zero approach as like a, a 
part of a cultural shift, right? And I think we want to be on the leading edge of that cultural shift and how companies are thinking about, you know, diversity and inclusion programs. Yeah, I so, think yeah. Spot's a good example. Like, right now, it's basically for uh, harassment discrimination reporting at workplaces. And it, it could get bigger, like it could target a bigger market by expanding from that, right? It can go from just harassment discrimination to, you know, cust- large customers have asked us to make things for whistleblowers, for things like where mm-hmm. an employee is reporting something, but it's not necessarily harassment or discrimination. That would make it, quote unquote, bigger. I mean, the, the size of the market would be bigger. We can go outside of companies. We can make this for, for kind of other types of places. Um, but even within companies, we can decide, as I think, as you were just saying, whether it's for small companies or for big companies or kind of for everyone. And we're not necessarily making these decisions based, in fact, we're not at all making these decisions based on which is the larger opportunity. We're making it based on where do we think we can have the, you know, the truest product. And then because right. any of those segments is big enough where if you do it really well, it's a, it's a right. good outcome. Yeah. And we made the decision to focus for now on harassment and discrimination because we want to be able to do that really well. And so I don't actually see the, the temptation to kind of um, expand everything outward and be like, oh, we're harassment and discrimination and also compliance and also whistleblowing and also, you know, reporting of any kind of possible incident that violates your company's policies. Right? that's just not we're, we're experimenting with it a little bit with the larger customer, but it's just not where we want to be spending the bulk of our time right now. So, yeah, maybe not the biggest possible market. So now we're going to take a listener question from Ari. And thank you, Ari, for sending over these great questions kind of week in, week out. I'd like to hear from All Turtles leadership team the reaction to a quote in the Wired interview of Jeff Hinton. And Jeff Jeff Hinton's one of these kind of godfathers of deep learning technology. The quote is, there's a question of whether regulators should insist that you can explain how your AI system works. I think that would be a complete disaster. Is that the full quote? No. So actually, I would encourage everyone to, interested in this topic to read the full interview. We'll, we'll post a link to the Wired, to the article. It's, it's interesting how Jeff has these really strong sort of ethical considerations for AI and talks a lot about the weaponization of AI and even calls for a sort of Geneva Convention designed to prevent against it. And he's, he was actually, he was really instrumental in Google not picking up a, uh, a big defense contract for drones. But the, the full quote was, I'm an expert on trying to get the technology to work, not an expert on social policy. One place where I do have technical expertise that's relevant is whether regulators should insist that you can explain how your AI system works. I think that would be a complete disaster. People can't explain how they work for most of the things they do. When you hire somebody, the decision is based on all sorts of things you can quantify and then all sorts of gut feelings. People have no idea how they do that. If you ask them to explain the decision, you're forcing them to make up a story. But we're not talking about how you build your company. We're talking about how you build out your technology. Right. Right. So it's like it's akin to saying, you know, no one at Google should be able to explain how the algorithm that like recognizes faces and photos works, which we all know that one of the problems with not being able to explain how it is that you created or trained this algorithm led to like like really problematic conclusions. So why shouldn't you be able to explain the decisions behind your technology? Yeah, it seems like kind of a throwaway answer. Well, it seems a little like a um, a knee jerk reaction to just the the term regulator, mm. um, which we all are familiar with in Silicon Valley. That knee jerk reaction. Yeah, I mean, I think I had the same knee jerk reaction, right? Which is the the easy one, right? Which is to say that like, well can explain it and regulars aren't going to understand it. That's kind of the issue, right? Is like, I, yeah, I think it's a good good policy and practice in general to be able to explain things. Uh, you're going to do it to the satisfaction. Who's going to judge whether that explanation is sufficient? I guess the regulators will right. judge it, which I guess is their point. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't, like, a lot of those explanations are going to feel different from what people are used to and explain how they, how the algorithms get together, but you can't, you can't necessarily explain the individual decisions that those algorithms will take, I think that's what most people conflate, right? I can mm. I can work through how a system is constructed, but that doesn't answer any whatever specific decision or action the system took. That may be more opaque to people. And we do have to kind of get comfortable of living in a world where we, we don't have a human quality explanation for mm. every particular decision. Right. Uh, but we should be able to talk about how we design and train 
our AI systems. Yeah, I think I think that's right. It's just like be, let's be prepared for a series of unsatisfactory explanations because they won't actually be like neat stories that you can put a bow around that sort of say, oh well, I see. Here's why you decided on this particular thing. Like mm-hmm. those things just aren't going to exist. But yeah, I don't. I I think it's fine to expect explanations from people. People should be intentional about what they do. If people can't explain the decisions they make for like truly significant systems like the one that we're talking about, then it's then we don't stand any chance of, you know, combating unethical application of those systems or bias in those systems. Right. We have to be able to explain the decisions we made so that we can look at the conclusions that we get and then tweak the decisions that we make the next time. Yeah, that I think that especially applies to founders now working on new stuff. Like Facebook is relatively entrenched and is going to kind of have their way with regulators to this point. But mm-hmm. working on something new and you want to maintain you know, both consumer trust, you have to be building these relationships with people ultimately in charge of how your your company gets utilized. Right. And it's a little bit about sort of having, you know, things that you can point to around hiring, for example. Like, I thought that that part of the quote was actually really indicative, mm-hmm. right? Like, I can't tell you how I hire people or, like, make decisions. Well, you probably should right. be able to talk about how you hire people and make decisions because if there's no practice in place that you can point to or talk about, then, you know, there's you're not holding yourself accountable for the way that you're building your company or in this case, your AI system. Yeah, I mean, I do think there's an there's a valid point here about many of these explanations are going to be fundamentally unsatisfying. Mm. And so we just have to, like, adjust what we do with that. Uh, like, we can't demand a satisfactory explanation because a lot of them just by definition aren't going to fit into the narrative structure that, you know, we're used to thinking about as a good explanation. Sure. The other I think potential problem here is uh, something that Jessica, that you've been saying for for a while, which is like at some point, like it matters what you were thinking when you made something, but that doesn't matter as much as what you actually wound up making. So a lot of the bad effects that we're seeing from technology right now was not intentional. You know, Facebook can explain all they want, what they were thinking when they made the algorithms. The point is they made what they made and they can be abused easily, Mm -hmm. whether or not they were designed that way or not. It's kind of a different question. But yeah, yeah, in literary and cultural studies, you call this the intentional fallacy, right? Yeah. You cannot, like, hypothesize about the intent of the person who created a text. You can only interpret and deduce from the text that was created. Yeah, but I I do think it's not bad practice for, uh, if you're going to make something, think about how you would explain how you made it and why. Mm-hmm. Be prepared to to say that. Yeah, and be prepared to, you know, come to the realization that, like, your your intentions may not have been realized. Like your well meaningness right. might not have come through in the final product. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode in the world class Donatello Studios in San Francisco, California. Thanks to Michelle Joe for joining us for this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy-Thompson for production supervision and editorial management, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Micah Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Ommerman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, and yours truly, John C. Fuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening. <laughs>